I know this is a weird way to start off a review, but nothing major really happens in this book. It picks up after the fight from the previous issue. Spencer and Aaron are smashed up and in the hospital, and they both get a visit. Aaron gets visited by Spencer's father, while Spencer gets his mom. And she goes full black mama on him. The only thing missing was her grabbing the side of that cloak. What happened is that Spencer beats the holy hell out of Aaron, just unleashes on him. First with his teleportation spell, putting so much power into it that he wrecks Aaron's face, and then with his fist. He just destroys the dude's mug. One real quick thing here. Harry Randolph, I like this pose. The first time you did it. But you've used it in every issue. It's a cool pose. Well drawn, the message is delivered, but there are other poses. Find one. Vogue if you have to. But please, let this one rest. Anyway, Aaron and Spencer use what appears to be a forbidden spell, and this causes them to see each other's memories, and then they both black out. So Spencer's mom magically pimp slaps him for what he did to Aaron, and keep in mind she's not supposed to be using magic or have a wand because she's a woman. But Spencer is angry because his father went to see Aaron and not him, and that goes back to Spencer's daddy problems. Meanwhile, Spencer's dad tries to help Aaron out as best as he can, knowing that the boy is going to go to magic jail for his crime of falling in love with a white woman, I mean his charge. That's pretty much all that happens. But as I was reading this, I kept thinking, why does this work? I mean, this is an SJW book. Just read the commentary at the end of each issue. Brandon Thomas and Carrie Randolph are like two seconds from speaking Swahili and wearing Africa medallions. And yet, this book is really good, which is unusual for this kind of book. So what happened? Why does this work? The more I thought about it, the more I remember something I learned back in my fiction writing classes. You need to remove the bugaboos. Here's what I mean. A lot of writers have go-to topics they lean on. They like to write about these pet issues, and what happens is that they rely on these archetypes, usually caricatures, to tell the stories. Since everyone knows what those are, it's easy to make even a weak story work. Many writers make their livings on these kinds of stories. But if you really want to see if a writer is any good, take away the pet issues. Take away the bugaboo. Strip it all away. You can have none of it in the story. Now let's see what you can do. And the easiest way to do this is to take what you want and make everything that. So if your bugaboo is race and you're black, then your entire cast needs to be black. Everything has to revolve around those characters. You can have subtle nods to white racism, but nothing overt. They're basically not there either in the principal cast or in the story or even in the fictional world at all. If your bugaboo is about transphobia, then make everyone transgender. Same with sex. If you're a feminist, then your whole cast is female. What this does is force you to shift the focus of the conflict. Normally it'd be the evil white men who cause all the problems, but now they're not there, so the antagonist has to be a woman. The source of the conflict has to come from a woman. You have no choice but to build it around them because otherwise you will have no story because nothing happens. That's the danger of removing the bugaboos. A bad writer doesn't know what to do because they don't want to get their precious protagonist dirty. You take away the evil men or the so-called cisgender people or white people and they're lost. Their source of conflict is always this other thing, this other group. But do that to a good writer, even a true believer, and they'll go, okay, now I have no conflict. Let's make some. And that's what happens with excellence. Brandon Thomas gets rid of his bugaboo, probably for a politically motivated reason, but the result is the same. There are no white people in the main cast. And then he shows his skill and talent by rising to that challenge. His entire cast is black. They have to be the source of the conflict. And just like that, he's got story, he's got character development, he's got nuance. Spencer is our hero, the guy we're supposed to root for, but he's also an entitled jerk. We get where he's coming from, but he's so fueled by his anger and hate against his father and Aaron that it defines him. Aaron flat out tells him this and says, quote, What would you even be if you stopped? That's a character flaw, and a pretty big one. It's one that causes our hero to pummel a guy who, as far as we can tell, has never done anything to him. Spencer's simply jealous of Aaron's relationship with his father. They're both looking at the same thing, but drawing different conclusions. Spencer sees Aaron as the son his father wished he had, and Aaron sees Spencer as a whiny, entitled brat. They're not entirely right, but they're not entirely wrong either. That kind of nuance would never happen if Aaron were white. By removing white people from the story, it forces Thomas to show the nuances he probably never even think about. And you can see this in other writers. Could Kwanzaa Sajefa write this story? Take away the evil white man narrative? 
No, he'd be completely lost. Could Magdalene Visaggio write a transgender version of this? Not even if Scott Snyder were standing there guiding her hand. Could someone like Mark Wade strip away any SJW politics? Oh, hell yeah. Not only could he do it, he could do it half asleep. That's how talented and skilled he is. Still a jackass, but also a solid writer. And that's what Brandon Thomas brings to the table, possibly for a different reason, but with the same result. He can't rely on blaming white people for everything, either in the context of a story or the broader narrative, because there are no white people in the main cast. He has no choice but to make the black people the source of the conflict. And because he's a good writer, he doesn't shy away from it. He also creates internal conflict for Spencer, and then has Spencer acknowledge that he's the source of some of his problems. This is normal for any other story, but virtually unseen in SJW stories. Progressive writers just don't like to go there, but a good writer can't help himself. The SJW mentality is like Schwartz with his tongue stuck on the pole, and Brandon Thomas is like Ralphie. Come back, don't leave me, come back. But the bell rang. Come back, come back, come back. Sooner or later, someone's going to come along and spit on the SJW's tongue and get them off the pole. But it's not going to be Brandon Thomas. He's too busy focusing on that official Red Rider carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle with a compass and a suck and his thing that tells time. He wants to tell a story, and to do that he needs conflict. So even if he would otherwise not present black people as flawed or in a negative light at all, as a good writer, he can't help himself. And that's why this story works. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.